That'd be cool. Well, when we call the meeting to order, we'll just ask people to stand and we will mute and you will, you'll be the, the speaker and then we will get on with our meeting. I'm just going to get my screen arranged a little bit here before we get started and you will do some practicing. And you'll join some esteemed ranks, Patrick, of people who have been delivering the pledge at our well, meeting. I appreciate that. Thank you, Council Member Prince. You bet. It really is a, it's becoming quite an honor. I'm Ms. Prince, are you on a... Um, I'm not on my headphone. Oh, no, I'm just trying to... Here, she, she got moved down. I'm trying to move people that are... Um, And I will um, add Ms. Moore. Um, Ms. Moore, are we ready to record? I am starting. Here we go. All right. All right, looks like we're ready to go. We even have a special guest, Kat. Things are looking good. All right, I will call the St. Paul City Council to order. Roll call. Tao. Here. Tobert. Here. Yang. Here. Jalali. Here. Baker. Here. Prince. Here. Council President Brenmon. Here. Seven present, no one absent. Uh, please stand and join Patrick Rubel from SPAR as he leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Consent agenda items um, 2 through 20 are before you for your consideration. All right. And um, we, I know we are pulling item number 2. Um, for separate consideration, as well as item number 18. Is there anything else I need to take for separate consideration? All right, and I will mention just in advance of these uh, that we have several items today, I think six that are coming in under suspension, which is highly unusual. So bear with us as we kind of work through the uh, some of the procedural logistics here. But we are pulling item number two and item number 18 for separate consideration and Ms. Jalali moves consent. Roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Aye. Council President Bradmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The consent agenda is adopted as amended. Item number two, resolution 21-449, consenting to the sale of general obligation library refunding bonds series 2021D to be issued by the St. Paul Public Library Agency for the refunding of prior bonds and levying a tax for the payment thereof. And um, on this item, I know um, Mr. Solomon came in and gave us a fantastic report last week and he was trying to um, slink off without giving us one today. But I just read um, your email summarizing the bond sale this morning and um, this item is pulled so that we can amend um, this uh, resolution to include the bond sales today. And, and if it's all right with you, Mr. Solomon, I wouldn't mind just if you could just quick summarize um, the bond sale for us today before we um, uh, vote on that amended version. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Council President Brent Mullen, Council Members, uh, City Treasurer Mike Solomon here. Um, as you noted, we took bids this morning on the city's 2021D library refunding bonds. Um, these bonds will refinance our 2010 bonds uh, that help to build the uh, library portion of the Arlington Hills Community Center. Um, we received four bids on the bonds today and got a total interest cost of 1.57%. Um, so for a 14-year bonds, that's a very low interest rate. Um, since we were refinancing these bonds for interest rate savings, uh, we were able to realize a $527,000 uh, present value savings. 
and that's uh, more than 10% of the amount of debt service that we're refinancing. So um, a good story uh, to save some dollars and a great result um, with, the, with the items that we're bringing here today. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. I thought it was worth, um, worth sharing that out. Um, Ms. Princess, Library Board Chair, do you have anything to add? Thank you, Council President Bren Moen. I just want to, again, on behalf of the Library Board this time. Oops, you, you somehow went on mute, Ms. Princess. Yeah, I wanna thank our amazing staff and, um, and also I guess I should be grateful for the current economy, which is giving us a fabulous interest rate. So thank you so much, Mike, and thanks to your whole team. That's a half a million dollars is, is a real big deal. So um, indeed. So Ms. Prince, um, we'll move the amended version. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tobert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Baker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The resolution is adopted as amended. Item number 18, resolution 21-572, declaring April 2021 as Fair Housing Month in St. Paul. All right, so on this item, I know we have several um, sponsors of this and it was uh, really brought, this is something that we do on a fairly regular basis, but it was brought uh, back to our attention by SPAR um, this year. And um, we today have um, Patrick Rubel, who we uh, met previously, and I believe Brian, um, now I'm blanking on Brian's name, Wagner. Yep, um, also here in attendance to um, share, sorry about that, um, Mr. Wagner. Um, and then I'm looking at Ms. Naker, did you have um, thoughts to kick us off before we turn it over to SPAR? You were nodding. I, I was nodding enthusiastically. enthusiastically about Brian's last name, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to comment later. All right, well, why don't we turn things over to Brian and Patrick? So Brian, if you want me to, I'll go first. Is that all right? All right. Sounds Perfect. So good afternoon, Council President Bryn Moen and members of the council. Again, my name is Patrick Rubel and I've been a resident of St. Paul for more than 30 years. Uh, my involvement and work in the city runs deep and long. Uh, first as the president of the World Theater Corporation on behalf of Minnesota Public Radio, working as an independent contractor for job placement and job development with the Urban League of St. Paul, as the government affairs director for the St. Paul Area Association of Realtors, and now as Realtor and Manager of the Coldwell Banker Realty Office in Highland Park. I'm also a past president of SPAR and currently serve on the National Board of the LGBTQ Plus Real Estate Alliance as their secretary. So diversity, equity, inclusion, and fair housing are near and dear to my heart. On behalf of the more than 7,500 members of the St. Paul Area Association of Realtors, I'm here today to thank you the St. Paul City Council for adopting this Fair Housing Proclamation as we commemorate the Fair Housing Act passed in 1968. While we acknowledge April as Fair Housing Month, as realtors, we endeavor to be fair every day in our work to secure housing for all. Housing discrimination based on the protected classes outlined in that act and those additional protections outlined in St. Paul's City Charter that include creed, sexual, or affectional orientation, ancestry, age, marital status, or the receiving of public assistance is unacceptable. Before this legislation was passed in Minnesota and throughout the country, the real estate industry prevented many people from access to quality housing and wealth growth through home ownership. The Fair Housing Act was the first step to remedy this, this injustice. Since its passage, the Fair Housing Act has contributed to the city's continued integration efforts and has increased access to quality housing and home ownership for many. Although there has been significant improvement in these areas, there are still issues of discrimination in housing. For example, in 2018, there was an 8% uptick from the previous year in housing discrimination complaints nationally to over 31,000. That's the highest the National Fair Housing Alliance has recorded since it started publishing this data in 1995. 
Of the over 31,000 complaints filed in 2018, 51% were about disability, 17% were about race, and 83% of all the complaints can be attributed to rentals. There is still much progress to be made. The Fair Housing Act as a follow-up to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 has been a lasting legislative achievement of the civil rights era. The Fair Housing Act is a vital piece of legislation from that period in our country's history, and it continues to protect many Americans from discrimination in housing. As a realtor and a member of the St. Paul Area Association of Realtors, we are committed to the goals outlined in the Fair Housing Act. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Rubel. Mr. Wagner. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Wagner. I have been a resident of the McAllister Groveland neighborhood uh, for 20 years now. Um, I'm also um, an at-large representative for our district council within Mac Groveland. Um, I'd also like to thank you all for supporting the Fair Housing and Fair Housing Act with this proclamation. The purpose of the Fair Housing Act is to prevent discrimination in housing and reverse segregation in housing. Although the law has gone a long way towards re reaching these goals, they have yet to be fully realized. Like my Patrick, uh, colleague Patrick noted, in 2018, there were more than 31,000 complaints filed for housing discrimination. And the Brookings Institute analysis of the Census Bureau data from 2015 to 2019, quote, shows that despite the fact that people of color account for the vast majority of recent US population growth, white residents almost everywhere, including those in the nation's most diverse metropolitan areas, continue to reside in mostly white neighborhoods. At the same time, Black and Latino or Hispanic Americans in most metropolitan areas reside in neighborhoods that are just proportionately comprised of members of those same groups. This goes to shows that we have not yet achieved our goals outlined by the Fair Housing Act, which brings attention to us doing so is so very, very crucial. As an aside, um, knowing with my work of a colleague um, that they gave me an example of, of discrimination um, of, of uh, a married couple, two men, um, that uh, wrote a letter as a part of their offer, and it came to light that ultimately the reason they didn't get the house uh, was because um, they were gay, um, a protected class. Um, and uh, they decided not to actually file a complaint, but just let the, the thing pass. Um, and so the, the, the number of 31,000 is really actually, I think, underrepresented in relationship to the total number of, of complaints that are actually out there. I'd also like to mention that I'm a proud member of the St. Paul Area Association of Realtors, an organization of over 7,500 members. Um, I office on Grand Avenue in the Crocus Hill Cobalt Banker office. And as an organization, we've made an effort to promote fair housing and contribute to organizations that further the goal of the Fair Housing Act. Among those contributions, to, contributions include the Mapping Prejudice Project and sponsorship of the Rondo Commemorative Plaza grants for acquisition and development of the Center for Diverse Expression in the Rondo community. SPAR is also putting on a variety of Fair Housing Month activities for our realtor members, including encourage them to take, um, uh, take part in the Fair Housing Pledge. As a citizen of St. Paul and as a realtor and as a member of SPAR, I'm committed to upholding these ideas and goals set forth in the Fair Housing Act, and I'm so very glad to see the city of St. Paul is committed to them as well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. I saw um, Ms. Prince had a hand up earlier. Was that, yep, Ms. Prince. Thank you so much, Council President Brenmon, and thanks Mr. Wagner and Mr. Rubel for your incredibly important comments today for, for our St. Paul community. Um, it's, it's amazing to me in all the years that I've worked around in and around City Hall in St. Paul, that the St. Paul Area Association of Real Realtors has consistently been just an incredibly important and effective partner to the city of St. Paul and its housing efforts. And I want to thank you for that. I also want to say that how meaningful your comments are today. Um, as you may know, this council passed a resolution unanimously on January 13th, committing to the exploration of reparations in St. Paul. And your acknowledgement of our, our sad history our, our, of redlining racial covenants and the destruction of the Rondo neighborhood is clearly indicates that 
you, like our city, believe that, that these wrongs are appropriately righted in our lifetimes. And so I want to thank you as well for being a partner in our reparations work as we move forward. Thank you, Ms. Prince. Um, Ms. Naker. Thanks, Council President. I, I want to echo Council Member Prince's thank you to you both. And I want to also point out, I found both your comments and the way that this resolution is worded to really do an excellent job of balancing the, the power and the limits of, of legislation. Um, I think sometimes we, we do one but not the other. And I think it's important to recognize and celebrate progress, especially the progress that that we can make with major landmark pieces of legislation like the Fair Housing Act. And also we can never rest and we can't be complacent. So celebrating progress does not mean we have license to, to stop working hard because legislation is never enough. Um, and I also wanna thank um, you so much, Patrick and, and Brian for your comments. I think the taking accountability the way that, that you did um, for the way that realtors have, have acted in the past compared to how, how SPAR um, conducts itself now is really is really important. And I think we're doing that as a community right now in our mapping prejudice work. We're really reckoning with the fact that we have racial covenants written into the deeds of our homes and um, just looking those those injustices square in the face and taking responsibility for them. So so thank you for your words. Thank you. And I I um I thank you as well. I would will say that I wish that this was as planful as it probably sounds, but the next item on our agenda is a report um, from our city attorney Lindsay Olson talking uh, about a program called Just Deeds, which is um, tackling redlining um, directly. And so I think that um, it's a, it's teeing up the next conversation and really um, aligning with our commitment um, that to um, to fair housing. And I also, uh, so stick around if you want to hear that um, report from um, Ms. Olson. I, like I think, it. yeah, it's very appropriate and it, it's a um, perfect thing to follow this uh, this resolution. And I will just say that I've um, learned a, a bit more about the real estate industry in the past few months. And I really um, have never n known an industry to be so focused on integrity. And you know, when I look through the, the values that are presented in the fair housing resolution, that is part of your certification and requires that you align with those goals and values. And um, so I know that you're living that every day and that it, by obligation and because that's your passion and calling. So I, I, um, I, I even more understand the connection between SPAR and you're bringing this forward and, and keep in the front of our mind. I'll open this item and see if there's any other comments. And seeing none, uh, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The resolution is adopted. Thank you very, thank you very much. We uh, need a suspension of the rules. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Tom moves suspension of the rules. Roll call. Tao. Yes. Aye. Tolbert. Councilmember Tolbert, we can't hear you. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The rules are suspended. Um, we now have a staff report 21-68 from City Attorney Lindsay Olson regarding just deeds. And this item we um, mentioned just briefly a moment ago and um, think that we um, are um, Honored to have City Attorney Lindsay Olson here today to talk about a program that I think we'll all be very excited to um, learn more about and hear about our uh, involvement as well. So welcome, City Attorney Olson. Thank you, Council President Bremelin, Council members. I'm honored to be here today to talk to you about a little bit about Just Deeds, which is a coalition of cross-disciplinary organizations whose goal it is to acknowledge the harm caused by the discriminatory covenants that were mentioned just a little bit uh, previously and actively work to dismantle those structural and institutional racism factors through education and action. 
So these principles include mapping prejudice that was mentioned. Uh, and for many of us, I know we heard from the mapping prejudice organization um, maybe a year and a half ago or so. And I know that they recently um, just finished mapping Ramsey County. I know that those results aren't out yet. I've spoken with some of the mapping prejudice folks and we will be working closely with them as well as the Minnesota Association of City Attorneys and uh, Edina Realty and the um, Area Association of Realtors, St. Paul Area Association of Realtors as well. So um, I do appreciate being here today uh, on this. It's um, all, as the council president said, sort of coming together, which is really great. But uh, in 2019, the Minnesota legislature passed into law, um, passed a law to allow property owners to renounce discriminatory covenants on their properties. Um, but I think that that's kind of little known. And uh, so between the Mapping Prejudice um, Project and the Just Deeds Coalition, um, we're working to raise awareness of that and assist property owners in erasing these covenants within our community. So the coalition actively works to educate about the historically racist practices, the deliberate and pervasive damage uh, that discriminatory covenants have caused and how these systems directly have benefited white people in the past. Um, the coalition is also taking an active role in identifying these discriminatory systems and creating resources towards um, working for equity. And um, we have uh, a resolution before you today to uh, have the city attorney's office lead for the city, have the city of St. Paul join the Just Deeds Coalition. And um, we believe as government, we play a significant role in the use and dismantling of these di historical discriminatory covenants. And uh, we would like to, in the city attorney's office, lead an effort to um, do legal work within our office to assist people within our community to erase these covenants from their properties in alignment with our real estate section um, and uh, as well as the Realtors Associations um, and other needed um, property records offices to, to help people uh, who wanna do this and ensure that they don't um, incur costs and that we're working within the system to make sure that we um, not just identify, but, um, but erase as many as we possibly can. And in this way, um, we're actively working to um, dismantle those long lasting consequences and the legacy of inequity within our community. So um, with that, I, um, I wanna turn it over to any questions that any council member might have for, for me uh, about our work and um, what we can expect or uh, what the totality of the work is about. I'm sorry, Ms. Baker. Thanks, Council President. Um, thanks, Director Olson. You mentioned a resolution and I don't see one attached here. Is there gonna be a resolution brought in the future and are there budget implications of this? Or I'm just wondering what sort of our authority and what, what help you need from us is here. Sure. Um, my understanding was the resolution had been put in under suspension. Um, it's not attached for you guys. I guess I wasn't aware of that, but if it didn't get put in, um, we can make sure it gets put in this next time. Um, we had tried to put that in earlier in the week and um, so I apologize if it's not available for you today, but the resolution is for uh, the council to adopt um, and approve our participation as an office and, and as a city in working um, to dismantle these covenants. So um, that's the basis of the, the resolution. And I, I fully support the um, intent. I just, and maybe I'm just missing it, but do others see the resolution actually attached? No, I, and okay. I, you know, it could be that it's it, it errors on our end. We entered this as a staff report um, from the city attorney's office and not as a resolution. I don't have a resolution um, in front of us, but if there is a resolution that we need to pass, we certainly can enter it for next week's um, meeting and pass it through on consent. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll check in on that. Um, I guess I had understood that something had been put in. So I guess we'll figure out where the error is and correct that and get the resolution in. So um, apologize for that piece of it, but um, but that's what my staff report was here for today, um, was to let everyone know what our intentions are and um, 
and the the resolution is really I, I think both a recognition and also um, for actual um, approval for our participation. It will obviously take staff time, um, but for us, it seems like a really good fit as far as um, you know our attorney's expertise and our attorney's time. And obviously, we have the ability to to access records and assist people in a way that that other organizations don't. Um, and it seems very fitting with the um, kind of the past participation um, of the city in those racial covenants that we would then in turn be responsible for dismantling them as well. And I, I am getting some information that there was an item and it was approved today in the afternoon. So it will just be on next week's um, agenda. Um, so this is a great discussion and then it'll come before us for a final or for a formal approval next week. I think we just, um, it's all good. Um, I see Ms. Prince and Ms. Yang have questions or comments. Ms. Prince. Thank you so much, um, Lindsay, for this presentation and for the willingness of the city attorney to get involved in this work. Again, this ties in so well with the, the city's, um, the city council's commitment to explore reparations. One thing I wondered is, um, so, so through this program, if maybe you could just outline again, someone would be able to contact um, someone in our office to, to research their deed and determine um, if there was a covenant that they could then remove and assist with that process. Um, I, I, and before you answer that question, I'm just wondering if there is any role for volunteer attorneys to assist with that, that it seems like there might be great interest in um, coordinating that kind of activity. Yep, thank you, Council Member. I, yes, to both those questions. So the first is yes, there is uh, a role for volunteer attorneys and the Just Deeds website does have a link for attorneys to go on and volunteer for the project as well. Um, so there's the city affiliation and then just individual volunteer attorneys that can also uh, volunteer to assist with the process. So both of those things are available. Um, and uh, I mean, tell me your other question again, I'm sorry. Your first question. Oh, about okay. how, it's how- just kind of what that process would look property. like. And maybe you don't know yeah. that. Well, I, I, I don't exactly know probably the, the nitty gritty details of that um, situation, but the uh, basically, so we will be working with the um, Mapping Prejudice organization that has identified properties throughout Ramsey County. So our St. Paul properties, um, I would think have basically been mapped. Uh, and we, so we would be able to identify those properties. Obviously we need the property owners involved in that process as well. So I would anticipate that we would do some proactive outreach um, to those identified property owners to say, hey, you know, if you're interested in doing this. Um, so we would plan to do, you know, social media engagement as well as some proactive outreach and then set up um, ways for people to contact us as well so that if they see it they can contact us and then we can um, begin assisting them so we would probably want to set up multiple avenues for people to hear about the project know of the opportunity um, and be able to to understand what the status of their properties are as well and I'll be finding out more of that as we continue to work with the mapping prejudice organization on this as well Thank you, Ms. Prince. Ms. Yang. Thanks. I'm really excited to hear our city attorney's office will be doing this work. I'm very supportive of it. I have a couple of questions. Do you, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, do you have an idea of um, maybe like the most common racial, racial covenants that will be coming your way for, you know, like personal advice on from, per, from property owners? And then the other question is, how long do we foresee the city attorney's office being involved in this work? Is it long term or is it short term? And are we going to be hiring on more city attorneys to do this work too? Um, thank you, Council Member. Um, I don't know the details of the covenants um, at this point. 
you know, what would be coming to us. Um, I haven't heard details from the Mapping Prejudice organization, but I can continue to update the council as we know more about the, the documents and the information that comes out from them and as we learn more about the work. I, I, we aren't planning to hire people specifically to do this work. This would be basically a pro bono effort of our office that we would take on in addition to our duties um, for the city otherwise. And I could tell you that the staff in my office is very excited and willing to do this work. Um, we had people coming to us as we tried to set this up saying, when is this going to be online? When is this going to be online? Because people really want to get involved and do the work. So I think it's something that um, everyone feels really, really good about doing and is really important to us and our values um, as an office and as a city. So um, a lot of excitement in the office about being able to work through work through these and dismantle these covenants. So um, I, I think as far as I'm concerned, as long as I'm the city attorney and there are covenants to 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 delete, we'll be doing it. I, I, I wouldn't see this as just a one year thing or um, or anything like that. I think we do the work as long as it needs to be done. And and if I'm understanding um, correctly, it, it really is kind of just the down and dirty, do the work. Um, there's not one easy, if we make this policy, everything changes. It's like a, a really just kind of a grind. Yes, Council President, it, it's it's about actually doing the legal documents that would be needed to dismantle the covenants in in the the real estate documents in the the title and with the deeds. Yeah. Yep. And so that's where the opportunities are for volunteer attorneys to do this work as well. I think it's great. I'm thank you for your leadership on this. And it's just it's like. At some point, it's just the work that we have to just sit down and do. Like when we're talking about dismantling, it's sometimes it's really taking out the pen and paper and making those changes that we need to make. So thank you um, for this. And we will look for the resolution um, next week on our council agenda and and um, get the ball rolling on this program. Great. Thank you, Council President. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. All right. Um, Mr. Tom moves to suspend the rules. Roll call. Oh, I'm sorry. Aye. Roll call. <laughs> Tao. Aye. <laughs> Tilbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Maker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The rules are suspended. Resolution 21-632, memorializing a decision of the City Council to deny an appeal by a Lattice LLC from a Planning Commission decision denying a site plan application for a new mixed-use development located at 411 and 417 Lexington Parkway North. Uh, Mr. Tao? This is... Uh, Mr. Tao? Thank you, Council President. Yeah, this is uh, bringing back to the Council to memorialize this, and so um, I want to thank um, all my colleagues for their input and in this uh, it was a very important vote uh, for the community and uh, I want to thank uh, Council Member Jalali, Council Member uh, Prince and Council Member Yang um, for uh, for their vote as well and um, I'd like to move forward. All right thank you Mr. Tao and again this is really procedural this is memorializing the vote we took last week um, normally, we see these things come up a few weeks later, but I think just in preparation or in anticipation of the 1599 um, timer, um, this is coming in quicker to memorialize the vote from last week. And I, I will um, be consistent in my vote, although this is procedural. Um, any discussion on Mr. Tao's motion to motion to approve? Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. No. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. No. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. No. Four in favor, three opposed. Those being Council Members Tolbert, Naker, and Brenmon. The resolution is adopted. Uh, Ms. Naker moves to suspend the rules. Roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Baker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. 
Seven in favor, no one opposed. The rules are suspended. Resolution 21-636, affirming the extension of declaration of local emergency issued April 12th, 2021 by Mayor Melvin Carter III. And this is an extension of 30 day extension of the emergency order. Is there any discussion on this motion? Uh, by Ms. Dinker, <laughs> I see none roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The resolution is adopted. Uh, Mr. Tolbert, most suspension of the rules for roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Maker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The rules are suspended. Resolution 21-629. Authorizing the fire department to enter into a joint powers agreement with the state of Minnesota Department of Health to provide emergency medical standby services for the FEMA vaccination site at the Minnesota State Fairgrounds. And this item is coming to us under suspension as a contract um, came together quickly. And of course, we um, want to prioritize getting um, our St. Paul firefighters uh, on the ground helping with vaccinations at the state fair. So um, I will just interrupt this broadcast to say we try to get our um, items not on suspension so the public has an ample time to see um, what is coming up on our agenda today. We had several items that were um, unavoidable to come in under suspension, but as you can see, it's kind of messy when we do it this way, um, although this one in particular seemed awfully important. So um, there, is a, there is a motion by Mr. Tolbert. Any discussion? Ms. Naker. Thanks, Council President. I just wanted to um, thank and commend Chief Inks for um, always being very conscientious about trying not to bring in items under suspension and especially not to have contracts come in front of us that have already taken effect or been signed. He specifically um, reached out to, to me and maybe to others to say um, why this was happening and to and to express how he normally tries to get these things in for our input before the contract has been signed. And I just really appreciate that. So wanted to acknowledge that and completely agree that the circumstances necessitated doing this quickly. Great, any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Baker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The resolution is adopted. Item 21, Resolution 21-594, amending the city's adopted legislative agenda for the 2021 legislative session. Um, all right, and um, I believe, uh, is there, uh, I believe Ms. Prince had a, a minor uh, verbal amendment to add to this. I'm just looking to see if other council members had anything to add before we made the small um, adjustment on this amended legislative agenda. All right, I don't see any, um, Ms. Prince. Thank you very much. I would, um... I would like to make the following amendment to our legislative agenda. It would create a final bullet point on the section on economic justice and inclusion. And the language is, and I'm sorry, um, Sherry, I should have sent this to you before the meeting, but um, to support direct appropriation for job training and workforce development of underserved communities. Okay, and I and I I believe that is a straightforward and simple enough amendment to just simply add verbally. Um, we can we will get that amendment. Um, and I, I did Miss Prince actually did. I feel like I saw that language earlier today. So um, so. No, okay, well, we'll, we'll get that. We will get that. We'll get that to you right now, Sherry. <laughs> Through the ether. Okay, so that, so the, um, and I support that amendment. Um, uh, and I believe we can vote on this as one bundle unless there's other changes. Is there any um, discussion on the amendment or the um, item before us? Um, seeing none, Ms. Prince moves the amended version. Uh, roll call. Tao. 
Aye. Tolbert. I'm sorry. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Baker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The resolution is adopted as amended. Item 22 is first reading of ordinance 21-12, granting the application of Hovda Properties LLC to rezone property at 1219 St. Clair Avenue from B1 local business to T3 traditional neighborhood and amending chapter 60 of the legislative code pertaining to the zoning map. All right, and this is the first reading, which is also a staff report if necessary. Is that, um, would you like a staff report, Mr. Tolbert, or are we good? I do not need a staff report, but I know staff is on the line in case anyone had initial questions. Are there any questions? All right. Okay. Do we? We right. normally don't vote on these. Um, I can just say that the ordinance is laid over to April 21st for second reading public hearing. Okay. Yep. That sounds good. I guess we hadn't anticipated that little change, but that's on that that works for now. Let's do it. Item 23, resolution public hearing 21-49, final order approving the reconstruction of streets in the 2021 St. Paul Streets program. All right. And on this one, are we getting a staff report? Um I, staff is on the line and I will have a few questions for him. I don't think we're going to do a formal report, um, but maybe I can um, speak a little bit. And then I believe uh, Nick Peterson is on the line, if not more people uh, from Public Works. If that works for the council member. Sounds, sounds great. So just want to give um, some background on this and also um, talk a little bit about it. So this is a um, street reconstruction project that's happening uh, in Highland Park, there are two streets included in this, uh, Edgecombe Road and Edgecombe Place. Um, I, I believe everybody has had a substantial amount of emails and um, contact from people regarding this project. I uh, want to point out that not only has that contact come via email, it's um, in the public record, both attached to the documents, but also in the public comment section of the Legislature. Uh, people have written on that project. I thought it would be um, also want to point out that um, some neighbors from Edgecombe Place have put together a YouTube video uh, and just to ensure I know everybody got it, but um, it, people wanted to make sure that everyone on the council had it. So I do want to at least mention that. Um, I think it's important too that there's, this is the same project, but they're two distinct, um, um, there, there's concerns uh, that are unique to each. And, and maybe I can talk a little bit about each of them and then go forward. Um, I'll start by saying that the project today um, is to go forward so that um, Public Works can go out to bid and get a contractor on, um, on to be able to do this construction project this summer. So that that is what we're doing. There are concerns about um, specifics on specific properties and, and where things lay. And some of those conversations um, are still ongoing. One of the things I will talk about um, is um, Edgecombe Road first, and that is the larger road. And it's, it, many people know it, it's a parkway that goes um, most directly from Edge, Edgecombe Park all the way down to um, the Highland, Highland Park Park. <laughs> um, when you're the Frisbee golf course, golf course, playgrounds, swimming pool, everything like that. Um, just to summarize some of the concerns um, on there to ensure that everybody here has heard them because I know people um, that have written in want to make sure all my colleagues hear the concerns that we've heard. Um, much of the concerns uh, stemmed out of the addition of sidewalks in an area that, on a stretch of road that does not currently have sidewalks. Um, that's where the initial um, objections have arisen. Um, subsequently, the um, conversation has turned to where the placement of those sidewalks are. Um, there's also been objections about um, tree loss um, during the construction project or to make way for some of the sidewalks. And uh, this group um, of neighbors have put together alternative plans of what that could look like, um, uh, of what street reconstruction project could look like um, 
I will say at the end of the day, I, I believe that the underlying issue here and the most significant issue is a project that is adding sidewalks where sidewalks are not wanted. Um, I will say this is also a street that's an important connection to the largest parks in Highland Air, in the Highland area and is an essential component to pedestrian safety. Um, as I've often said, particularly regarding this project, but on previous projects as well, I do not like seeing strollers in the streets. Um, but sidewalks are also important for people of all ages and all of any level of mobility in a community. Um, additionally, I will believe I do believe as I have communicated to this group of neighbors um, numerous times and numerous conversations um, dating back to at least 2019 um, when we had back when we used to have in person meetings. Uh, that sidewalks are an essential and important component within a city. Um, both for safety and for connectedness. And currently there is not a sidewalk pass from the um, northern part of that, of the sub neighborhood here to the, to the park, quite frankly. You have to walk in the street in order or go a couple miles out of your way in order to get to the, to the to Highland Pool, to get to the multiple um, playgrounds, to get to the golf course or the Frisbee golf course. Um, so I do, I do want to mention that and, and why they're also important for the entire city. Um, and I will say Public Works has worked with the neighbors. Um, I know there's still objections so because they haven't been able to meet all the um, requests. But I will say just a few things to t take away when, when um, that Public Works had to continue to keep in consideration during this. One, I will say um, Public Works has stayed completely within the city's right of way. They are not interested in acquiring land. Um, I think that's always important to know that um, where sidewalks are, where the street are, where all the work is supposed is um, would be done, it is in with the city's right of way. Um, also, it's important to note on this section, particularly because it's um, of where, where the location is, um, a minimum width is needed for fire rescue big rigs to be able to get through for fire safety purposes or ambulance purposes. Um, they've also tried to balance sidewalk distance from the road, um, which is a safety, con you know, obviously a safety concern where the sidewalk is and having a boulevard. Also, just from a practical, practical consideration, uh, sidewalks right against the street are um, very difficult when you have to plow it and, and then shovel it and, and vice versa. Um, and, and lastly, this is a unique stretch because you, we have a park, it is a parkway and a park land. And so I have to be cognizant about the parkland, particularly the median, which is um, all parkland. So I will say, I, I know not everything has been um, absolutely resolved, but um, I know Public Works has been out talking to individual neighbors um, and trying to meet their specific needs of where the sidewalk layout is based on where current landscaping and trees are. I will say, and it's I think it's both for to be important to be said both for this project as well as the Edgecombe Place part of it, is that this is a seri uh, a major reconstruction um, going on, and as as someone who just lived through our uh, RSVP last summer, um, the the size of the the construction vehicles, the size of the construction is. Um, it, you, you can feel it in the neighborhood. And, and even if it's outside the right of way, I, I think we used to kind of laugh at, at council meetings last summer because um, it, it always seemed that they did the major construction on Wednesday afternoons in front of my house and my computer would be shaking even if they were down the block. Um, it, so I just remind people that when Public Works is um, talking about things that are in the, in the right of way and whatnot. But I think Public Works has done a good job and I think sidewalks in this area are important for the greater neighborhood as well as this neighborhood currently. Um, if I can move on to um, addressing Edgecombe Place, um, which is- Mr. Tolbert, I would just, I thought I saw Ms. Ying's hand up. I don't know if it was a question directed to um, Mr. Tolbert's comments and before you moved on. That's okay, I can wait till Mr. Tolbert's done. Okay. Thank you. Um, Going down to edge complaints, um, this is a and, a, and this is what I'll have a question for Mr. Peterson or others on. Um, this is a unique road um, where that is laid out and 
um, based on our surveys where the right of way is and um, where the, the road currently exists. Um, it is a road that goes into basically what, I don't know if it's officially called that because it's a loop around, but a cul-de-sac um, for just imaginative purposes. Um, and um, there has been objections um, on, on this part of the stretch um, because in order for Public Works to operate in the current right of way, uh, it would move where the existing road is. Um, the survey and where the um, has the road in some parts, and it's 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 harder to explain than it is to see visually. But um, residents have objected to that with a push to try and keep the road close to where it's at. Um, I have talked to Public Works about um, this. And I do have a few questions for Mr. Peterson um, about the potential of uh, residents, um, as, as they've said they've been willing to do, um, deeding property over to the city. Um, and, and that would be a, a legal mechanism to, get, to give the city um, the property and um, disclaim any potential claims against the city because the city is not interested in, in purchasing property or obtaining property. Or, um, or, or any other way to get it, but if, if residents voluntarily do it. Um, Mr. Peterson, are you on this call? Council President Bren Moen, Council Member Tolbert, I am here, Nick Peterson with Public Works Street Design and Construction. So could you talk a little bit about what a path could be and the time that would need it? Obviously it would be relatively soon if we're gonna be going out to bid um, if this vote passes. Um, could you talk a little bit about what um, Public Works could do in order to um, potentially um, be deeded land and move the um, street to where the existing is um, and, and what that would look like and what the timeline on that would need to be. Council President Bren Moen, Council Member Tolbert, uh, what I could offer is uh, given the, the concern, the interest in Public Works uh, continuing to be uh, flexible with uh, Edgecombe Place. Um, there is an opportunity for the neighbors and public works to uh, collaborate a bit. And if there's an instrument that would be acceptable to both public works and the city attorney's office and executed by May 5th, we could implement some design changes before the contractor um, you know, gets gets started and, and gives us estimates that would cost the city more money. So um, by May 5th, if we could have an instrument again, that's acceptable to both public works and the city attorney's office um, and to, to, you know, finalize that transfer of, of property rights in some way, shape or form, um, that's something that we could stomach. Uh, it's gonna be a big lift, but mm -hmm. that's something that, um, we, we can stomach, you know, we do acknowledge that Edgecombe Place is, is narrower and it's, a, it, it's unique from a, a narrowness standpoint. And, uh, you know, you've, you've indicated there are some, you mentioned vibration and, and such. And so we acknowledge that there are uh, some of those challenges out there as well. Um, so we'd be happy to, to work with that. Um, Am I answering your question or would you? Yeah, no, no, that's perfect. I, I think the important point there is that Public Works is um, open to to um, having that conversation if if certain things are met. I do think it is also no, important noting what you pointed out that even if property is um, legally deeded over to the city in order to make these changes that it might not solve all the objections both with keeping potential trees as well as, um, you know, I, I know there's some structures that people don't want to remove or things like that. Is that correct? That's correct. So there would still be um, likely some some construction impacts just as a, a matter of, of, you know, the reality of construction practices. And there would be a, a, a need to be understanding that um, some of those improvements that might encroach into what's out there today um, are are going to be in jeopardy, and so we want to we want to try and protect 
some of those components that have been been out there. But at the same time, um, there will be some challenges in, in trying to reconstruct a road with the types of equipment and the, the types of compaction and, and vibration and whatnot that they could exercise. So I, I worry that there are still some of those risks from a construction standpoint. Um, but, you know, we're, again, um, happy as long as we can have an instrument and have a, a design that's finalized by May 5th. Uh, yeah, we, we could implement something. Um, the other thing I guess I'd, I'd offer a council member is the, the potential risk that goes with a, a right away transfer that, um, you know, it, it, it's not without risk that we undertake um, an activity like this. So just want to offer what that means. Mr. Tolbert, you're muted. I'm failing at that today. I apologize. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Prince, it's in your honor. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but uh, but uh, all right, I, I do think it's important to note um, it might not solve all the problems and it might not necessarily be feasible, but I think going down this path is important um, and for residents to know um, that, but I think it is also important to note how big some of this construction material or machines are. They are, um, and they shake the ground. So I think that should just be, be noticed, but thank you for public works being willing to do that. Um, the, um, other thing I will say maybe unless Nick, do you have anything else to add? Council president Council Brenlone, I council member Tolbert. I don't, unless you have any other questions. Okay. The other thing I'll, I'll add on is some people have um, some people have written in about um, not uh, where the project plans have been, and I just want to be clear and point everyone to this. I know some mailings have gone out, but if you go to stpaul.gov and the Public Works Department, those are on the Greg Sheffer page, paving project phase two. Um, those have been up for months. Um, if not longer. Um, I've pulled them up numerous times over the past couple months, but I just want to put that out there that um, for those who have said Public Works doesn't have stuff online, that's on there. Um, and I also just want to remind that in these construction RSVP reconstruction projects, uh, they are important um, and they are important beyond sidewalks. They're important beyond the road. Um, they also um, switch out the new water pipes. They switch out the sewer pipes um, and Oftentimes, I, I think public works engineers will say this more than the citizens living on top, but um, you know what's going on under the street is as important, if not more important, than what's going on above the street um, when we do these RSVP projects. Um, so with that, I think um, we have a good path to go forward. I, I think um, I'm going to support this, and I think the Edgecombe Place um, neighbors uh, can work with public works to try and get the potential easements that could um, move the road and leave the city without any um, potential legal claims against it's uh, against it um, as a result so thank you thank you mr tolbert ms yang thank you i had a quick question i know council member tolbert you um, went over this a bit, but was wondering if I could get a more thorough answer because when I read through the testimonies, there were a handful of people who did talk about the trees and how they were very concerned with tree loss. So what is the public work plan around that? So it's also like a concern that I share too around development. Yeah, and I I could have um, Nick, Nick answer, but I, I just say, I think in a general sense, some trees just won't make it through a construction project. I think that's that's one thing that, that happens, but they are going to be replaced is my understanding. Nick, can you talk about that? Uh, Council President, Council Member Tolbert, um, the answer to that is yes, trees will be uh, replaced. And, and actually we're anticipating a net increase in trees in the corridor. Um, there are currently are 50 identified vacant tree planting locations where trees didn't survive for one reason or another. Um, so those 50 locations would be replanted and the trees that are expected to be removed with the project would be replaced one-to-one. -one. 
and then in working with our forestry partners and in uh, um, in the corridor, we try to put in more trees where we can. Thank you. Are there other questions? It does not look like there are other questions. Um, so Mr. Tolbert would move to close the public hearing and approve discussion on that motion. Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 24. Resolution Public Hearing 21-87, authorizing application acceptance of a grant from the state of Minnesota to pre-design and design the Playwright Center facility in the amount up to $850,000, amending the 2021 city budget upon acceptance of said grant and approving and authorizing execution of a state grant agreement and other necessary documents in connection therewith. And Ms. Jalali, are you looking for a staff report on this item or do you have comments? Um, staff report, yes. All right. Do you know who's here for a staff report? I thought Christian was, but that could be. I'm gonna wait a second. Christian and, Taylor was here for another item. I'm not sure he's still on. He was here for the legislative agenda. That's okay. Um, I suppose um, I, in absence of one, I would just move to approve. Move to close the public hearing and approve. And um, and many this item itself has been before many of us, um, the Playwright Center, and this is just. Um, authorizing application and acceptance of a grant from the state of Minnesota, correct? That's right my on. understanding. And, and um, the, we, um, we've been working hard in our office to bring the Playwright Center to St. Paul. So this is certainly not a new issue, but um, I thought that there would be some addressing of it as it's in the latest phase. Either way, I'm very happy to move it forward and appreciate the support from folks. Thanks. Great. So there's a motion to close the public hearing and approved by Ms. Jalali. Uh, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Baker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 25, Resolution Public Hearing 21-90, authorizing a Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development application for Minnesota investment funds in an amount up to $600,000 on behalf of Clara Inc. and authorizing execution of a state grant agreement. Uh, Mr. Tolbert would move to close the public hearing and approve any discussion on this item, on that motion. Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 26, Resolution Public Hearing 21-91, approving the establishment of the Ford Site Housing Tax Increment Financing District Number 1 in the Ford Site Redevelopment Project Area and approving a tax increment financing plan, therefore. Mr. Tolbert? I know staff is online, otherwise I'd be um, happy to move approval. Are there questions for staff on this item? All right, seeing none, Mr. Tolbert moves to close the public hearing and approve roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. 
Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. The seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 27, resolution public hearing 21-92, approving the establishment of the Fort Site Housing Tax Increment Financing District Number 2 in the Fort Site Redevelopment Project Area and approving a tax increment financing plan, therefore. All right, and Mr. Tolbert, again, moving to close the public hearing and approve. Is there questions or discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 28, resolution public hearing 21-93, authorizing the Department of Human Rights and Equal Economic Opportunity to shift a portion of remaining funds for minority business development and retention from the MBDR special fund to the MBDR general fund account. All right, and we have um, Dave Gorski from Hero here to uh, give us an update. I'm making staff him a report. presenter right now. We're making you a presenter. We're upgrading you to first class here. All right. Good afternoon, Council Member, uh, Council President Brent Mellon and the Council Members. Can you all hear me? Yep, we can hear you and see you. Great. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. You'll give me just a moment. All right. Um, thank you for the time today uh, to present on what's, a, I think, a really exciting program that the City of St. Paul is embarking on. Um, it's being uh, led out of uh, two departments. Um, our office is down in Hero, and then we are also at this point partnering with the Public Works Department to um, identify some strategies for supplier diversity. Um, so just for a quick agenda, um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, an, a, a bit of an old item, the disparity study, which was done in 2017. Um, the disparity study, of course, being foundational, both from a legal and, and a practical perspective um, for the work that we do around supplier diversity. Um, specifically, I'll just highlight a few key findings from the disparity study, um, which lend support for the approach that we're taking uh, to create a supplier diversity program to increase opportunities for uh, women-owned businesses and minority-owned businesses and also our small businesses in St. Paul. Um, after that point, I will um, attempt to just explain uh, what the current tools that we have uh, available to address disparities in contracting um, and then also to highlight why those tools are fundamentally different than what we're talking about now, um, which will lead us to the background in the supplier diversity program um, and the, the uh, actually three resolutions we have before council today. So I'm here um, under the public hearing for the budget item, but we do have two related resolutions um, around our efforts with the uh, central cert program and also the newly or the very nearly newly created um, Section 3 collaborative um, across the metro area. So the disparity study, we refer to this as the 2017 disparity study. Um, that's actually when the study began. Um, it was conducted through 2017 and completed in the early part of 2018. Um, there was strong city council support for the city's participation in the disparity study. Uh, the disparity study in 2017 was the, to, to my knowledge, it still remains the largest and most coordinated um, disparity study that's ever been done in the United States. The state of Minnesota led the disparity study, um, and there were a total of nine uh, public entities that were participating uh, with it. And I would try to name them all, but I almost certainly will forget someone, so I'll just leave it at that. All the, I can send more information um, about every entity that participated, if anyone cares to, to dig into that detail. Um, but the council support was critical for us um, executing the disparity study, completing it, uh, specifically the resolution authorizing the city to enter a joint powers agreement with the state of Minnesota uh, to participate, and then also a separate resolution authorizing uh, budgetary support over several years to enable us to embark on this multi-year project. Um, at a high level, what a disparity study does is it evaluates all city contracting. So whether you're talking about uh, the purchase of 
pencils for an office, uh, office furniture, if you're talking about a service contract to um, you know, check the electrical or something like that, do the HVAC in city buildings, or if you're talking about um, uh, construction of a large public works project like a street, a sidewalk, a sewer, a bridge, um, it evaluates every type of purchase. Um, and what was uh, interesting, I don't know if it was entirely unique, but what was interesting about the city of St. Paul specific uh, element of this study was that we, we asked the consultants to separate out the city's purchases um, on contracts that were bid publicly through HERO, through our procurement division, and then also to separate out the um, projects and contracts that are awarded under the Housing and Redevelopment Authority's purview. So <clears throat> these, these would be things like um, um, grants, um, loans, and other sorts of subsidies for development projects that are happening around the city. Uh, and the reason we asked for this uh, breakout was that um, we believed that it would show, and it did in fact show, that the results on these two types of purchases are very different. And so we'll touch more on that shortly. Um, <clears throat> at a high level, um, the disparity study found, which um, is, I think, not surprising to anyone, that there's not a level playing field in the city of St. Paul for women-owned businesses and minority-owned businesses. We refer, to, we refer to these as WBEs and MBEs. Um, so as you see that, um, you see that abbreviation, that's what that's referring to. Um, at a high level, you can see um, in the chart on the right side of the screen there, um, if you look at the firms that are available in the city of St. Paul and in the metro area in the marketplace, um, we should see about a 21% participation by firms that are owned by women and uh, people of color. Uh, but we only utilized those firms in the most recent study at a rate of 16%. Um, this, uh, this disparity actually painted the city of St. Paul in um, a, fairly, uh, a fairly good light, at least as compared to many of the other entities that participated um, in that our disparity was smaller than many of the participating entities. Um, however, and what I'll show in the following slides, um, I think looking at this at this very high level masks the fact that there are still some real problems. Um, Outside of just the disparity that's apparent overall, there are some real problems when you dig into the numbers a little bit more thoroughly. Um, so the first uh, distinction I would point to is the difference between first tier spend and second tier spend. And we're talking about here is um, there's a real difference in the success of minority and women owned businesses um, in contracts that are awarded, uh, are entered into directly with the city where the city is actually a party to the contract with the vendor. Um, and those contracts that are awarded on a subcontract level. So mostly what we're talking about here is construction, although it's not exclusively construction. Um, but um, you could, if you wanted a quick reference point in your mind, you could just think of, you know, a, a public works project where they've got a prime contractor um, in charge of, you know, building a bridge, but then they've got subcontractors for masonry and draining and electrical and things like that. Um, so our, our minority and women-owned businesses do much better on that second tier level, but they have had much less success in terms of actually winning contracts directly from the city. Unsurprisingly then, um, women and minority owned businesses also, uh, when they do receive contracts, they tend to be smaller contracts. So you can see uh, that the, the vast majority of those contracts are um, uh, under $100,000. Uh, so the, the takeaway there is just that the most lucrative contracts um, are still out of reach for our women and minority owned businesses. Um, and then finally, um, I referenced the distinction between the City of St. Paul Public Procurement and the Housing and Redevelopment Authority um, grants and loans and development projects. Um, you can see there that we have far more success with um, the HRA projects that run primarily through planning and economic development. Um, those projects tend to do much better in terms of participation, although there still remains a pretty stark disparity for minority-owned businesses. That 5% number is still well below their availability. So to summarize, um, the takeaway here is that one of the places where we have the biggest gap is on the first tier, uh, contracts directly with the city and contracts that are bid through our public procurement process. And of course, those contracts are also the largest contracts um, that were evaluated and that are available for, um, for contractors to be awarded. Um, so we have this problem. We have this problem specifically in that area of public procurement on the first tier. Um, so what tools does the city have currently to fight this, to fight these disparities? 
Uh, we participate in the Central CERT program. So the City of St. Paul is the lead agency for the CERT program. Our partners um, on the collaborative are Hennepin County, Ramsey County, the City of Minneapolis. Um, and this is a, a one-stop shop for business certification um, and that, you know, a business gets certified with CERT and they can participate in any one of these uh, entities' um, small business programs. Um, the city has its minority business development and retention program where we work with um, primarily with nonprofit partners in the city of St. Paul to provide capacity building services and workforce training um, for CERT businesses, our Section 3 residents, our Section 3 contractors. Um, we have our Section 3 compliance program, and that focuses mostly, though not entirely, on housing and redevelopment authority projects that get subsidies from HUD. Um, we have our vendor outreach program, which requires our contractors to um, make their subcontracting opportunities available to minority and women-owned businesses. Um, and also under that vendor outreach program, we have a small purchase program. So we have a program that says up to a certain dollar level, the city needs to engage at least one certified vendor um, in its solicitation process if it doesn't go through a formal low bid process. Um, we've actually expanded that to go up to $175,000, but it still is a relatively small purchase program. Um, so high level, the takeaway here is just that, again, most of these um, efforts either focus on small purchases or they focus on the subcontract level, um, or if they, if they aren't directed specifically at those, the solutions here are not directed um, at engaging firms specifically on that first tier spend on publicly bid projects. Mr. Gorski, before you bump ahead, I just see um, Mr. Tao has a hand up, so if you could just quick pause for that. Absolutely. Thank you, Council President. Uh, Dave, thank you for uh, your report here. I'm just curious, Dave, you know, you this lie about the uh, um, uh, MBE and, and WBE, can you clarify if how, how many of those uh, businesses are actually originated from St. Paul, like the, the businesses are located in St. Paul? Um, I don't have that information um, readily available for you, Councilmember Tao. Um, we could run a report. It, it may it may be difficult at this point to ascertain from the disparity study data. Um, although I could certainly take a look, and I will take a look. Um, however, I, what I could easily uh, report to you is how many um, businesses actually in the city of St. Paul are registered with our CERT program and our Section Three program. Um, but I don't have those numbers uh, readily available. Yeah, and I and I think that's important uh, information to have because uh, I I am curious, you know, how many of these jobs or contracts are actually going to business that are from St. Paul, um, and and I think that's important. Not that we don't want outside vendors to to get work jobs in St. Paul, but uh, part of creating wealth is helping the business in St. Paul. Um, uh, you know, um, attain some of these uh, contracts. Absolutely. Um, I will, um, I, will, I can follow up with you uh, after the council meeting with some data on that. Great. And Mr. Gorski, that's a, just, if you want to, um, usually when one of us asks a question, we're all, <laughs> they piqued our interest and we're all interested in the answer. So if you just want to shoot that info to all of us when you have time to, to gather it, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. All right, and I, I apologize. I'm uh, it, on my screen. My uh, presentation's full, so um, if anyone raises their hand and I'm, I'm ignoring, please <laughs> interrupt me so that I. Uh, it's, that I it's okay. It's okay, Mr. Gorski. I just I'll keep an eye on that so that you can focus on your presentation. No okay. problem. Thank, thank you. Um, so this brings us to our uh, supplier diversity program overview and kind of the approach we're looking at with this. Um, so with a supplier diversity program, what we would be looking for is a program that increases opportunities for our diverse businesses at the first tier level um, for public purchases. Uh, this would, of course, champion the city's values of equity, justice, and inclusion. Um, and a, another piece that I think is overlooked is that this also helps us meet our purchasing needs because when there's strong incumbency, when there's a strong incumbency advantage with the city's purchasing, um, that doesn't foster competition and that can lead to lower value contracts or higher prices. So um, expanding our supplier base is beneficial to the city from a financial perspective as well. Um, and the, the other good news about this is that it aligns with efforts that we already have in place. So I referenced those tools that we already have um, to address disparities. You know, we have a substantial Section 3 outreach presence um, before the council today on the consent agenda. 
um, is a is a resolution authorizing the city to enter a JPA to create a Section 3 collaborative with six other local government entities. So to create something sort of similar to the CERT program, but for our Section 3 businesses. Um, with our CERT program, we've been working with our partners to create new programming that really targets um, areas of the CERT list that we purchase from and also areas of the CERT list that don't get a lot of public contracts. Um, and we're also working with partners both within the city, I referenced public works, but also outside the city, like the city of Minneapolis, Hennepin County, the state of Minnesota, all of these entities have some version of a small purchase uh, preference program for certified businesses. Um, and they're all, uh, and we've been in meetings with these folks, they're all trying to figure out ways that we can um, expand those efforts so that we can actually get some bigger, higher dollar value contracts to our diverse businesses and increase our diversity at that level. Um, and so that brings me then to the budget resolution before council today. Um, essentially, the need is that we need to build a supplier diversity program. Um, you know, we, it's, it's tied directly to the recommendations out of the disparity study. Um, and through our work in HERO, where we've been trying to figure out how we're going to devise this, we've really come to the determination that this requires some outside expertise and this requires a, a set of fresh eyes because a lot of these city um, policies and programs and practices are pretty entrenched and uh, it would greatly benefit our efforts to bring in um, an expert that has done this sort of work before, has built programs before, has worked with other uh, municipalities, preferably municipalities in, in and around the metro area to do this. Um, and specifically what we're looking for is assistance with gathering the information with the city, um, assessing our programs, doing community engagement, and then helping us with the development, the documentation, the rollout and education, um, all with a goal of being completed um, by the end of this year. And so if council approve, if we are able to secure the approval today on the resolution, um, that would go a long way toward helping us get the resources uh, that, we, that we need to get this program off the ground. Um, and I, I finally, I'll just mention two of the two items on the consent agenda. Um, we've recently um, worked with our partners on the CERT board to update the search APA to uh, allow us to do some of this new programming that we've been working on. Um, and we've got a separate uh, resolution creating the Section 3 collaborative so that we can similarly coordinate our Section 3 efforts across the metro. Um, all in all, I think that these three efforts will position the City of St. Paul to be a leader in the supplier diversity space. Um, and I welcome any questions you have and thank you for the time. Uh, thank you for the time today. Thank you, Mr. Gorski. And I, um, Ms. Prince, I noticed you had a hand up, but I um, thought Dave was wrapping up, so I let him finish before right. we cut in. So sorry to make you wait. Ms. Prince. No problem. I, I, was, I was planning to wait till um, Mr. Gorski finished this great presentation. I am so pleased to see that this is happening. I want to acknowledge, um, first of all, that this has come up as part of our city council's open for business initiative as a way to promote opportunities for our local businesses. I'm incredibly excited about that. I also want to say that um, when I served as a council aide, uh, this was something that, that I had worked on quite a bit. And the work that we had done back then was what ultimately led to the creation of HERO as a department. And so I'm really excited to see that, um, that, that this initiative is coming forward from HERO that really beefs up our, our opportunities to ensure that women and minorities, women and people of color um, are, are getting, are, are, are being considered for the important opportunities that we are providing. This is especially no, notable with Section 3 um, because Section 3 involves the use of federal money in St. Paul. And as we all know, um, it's looking really good for us to be getting processing some money through the American Rescue Plan and through other, um, hopefully an infrastructure bill that comes forward where these opportunities being targeted to low income people in our community who sign up for Section 3 and small businesses in our community or businesses in our community that qualify for a Section 3 consideration. This is just going to be music to the ears of many 
um, advocates out there who are paying attention. I want to call special attention to Pastor Frederick Newell, who I hope is watching today. Um, Pastor Newell is a strong advocate and, and dedicated proponent of the Section 3 program in ensuring that our public entities use it to the full extent of how it, it um, should be used and can be used to lift people up in our community. And I want to recognize um, Pastor Newell and the group of advocates that he works with and called the Access Group, who, um, who will be able to see that we're doing something really meaningful. Um, they had also reached out to the council's audit committee and said, you know, you might want to look into how Section 3 is working and, and how some of our contract compliance efforts are working to ensure that, um, that women and people of color in our community are, are being made aware of these opportunities. So I, I am really grateful for this initiative and for the work of the department and the work that um, Director Jensen is doing to make this happen. This is this couldn't be more timely. Thank you, Ms. Prince. Um, I see uh, Director Jensen has a hand up. Hi, I, I don't want to take a bunch of time, but I do want to thank David for putting this together and um, to mention a lot of the work that's been going on with Public Works and the Chamber and um, even the Department of Administration, we have really tried to create um, some partnerships with people who have already done some of the work where we are reaching out to them and partnering with them um, to really make sure that once we do get the program up and running, that uh, there's a real strong foundation and understanding of the impact that it can have um, obviously within the city, but also just across the state and trying to cr set um, Hero up and the city up to be a leader um, in this area. There's just a huge amount of opportunity. I also wanted to say thank you to um, Director Kershaw from Public Works because he came forward very early on in his tenure to partner with me um, and to make sure that David and Andrea, who um, direct, Deputy Director Ledger, um, have the support that they need to have a department in the city who's willing to really be intentional about the work um, and to, to be able to pilot so that we can work out the kinks and figure out the best way to move the work forward um, in the city as a whole. So I think there's just a really great opportunity here and um, I'm excited about it. Um, I also wanted to say thank you um, to the council and for all the work that you've done in supporting Hero. This um, Friday will be my last day as the director of Hero. Um, and so I hope that you will continue to support the work that David and direct Deputy Director Ledger and the work that our new direct Deputy Director Butler um, will do in Hero because um, I think the work that Hero does is so critical uh, to really serving um, both economically and obviously through our human rights and labor standards, um, the real important needs of um, our residents in the city of St. Paul. So thank you for the work that you all do and please continue your support of HERO because the work is critical to the overall success of the city. That's a big little update you just gave us, um, Deputy Jensen. We're all sort of like, um, you, we need a little more warning. <laughs> um, I was just about to thank you so much for your leadership. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that we, you know, know it comes under the guidance and, and the leadership from you. So I, I don't know the details, but I'm hoping it's upwards and onwards. Um, and we are just really grateful to have your service um, to the city and our the HERO department. So thank you so much. We are grateful. Uh, other comments on this abrupt <laughs> news or the report we just got, Ms. Jalali. Thank you, and yeah, um, appreciate this chance to spend some time with you, Director Jensen, and what is 
um, the last few days here, I echo people's just um, surprise and good hopes that you are on to a new chapter and that there's been um, so much good work that you have done at the city and looking forward to staying connected with you. And I wanted to simply speak to the exhaustive work that has gone into us and this and um, thanks to Dave and staff because I think that ultimately this type of internal procedural and process reform within our own bureaucracy is about how we make it easier to hire our community to support our community. That's really what it's about to me. It's about putting our money where our mouth is and making sure it's easier for us to do that, to be able to um, give our businesses a city to incredible suppliers doing all kinds of work that uh, is part of our racial equity goals. So I simply wanted to speak in favor of that. And then um, I didn't know we'd have you here today, Director Jensen. So um, thank you for being here as well and um, looking forward to supporting this and all our shared work in the future. Thank you, Ms. Jalali. Thank you. All right. Uh, we uh, have a resolution public hearing in front of us. So I would take a motion from Ms. Prince uh, to close a public hearing and approve any final discussion on that motion. Seeing none. Thank you. Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Council President, we have a strange situation. Somehow our next item, item 29, dropped off of our agenda. We did um, publish it in the legal ledger as being whole, but at some point it dropped off. So if it's okay with you, we'll go to that item. All right, and so would we need to uh, suspend the rules? We're getting good at that. <laughs> Probably just to be safe. All right, Ms. Yang moves suspension of the rules. Roll call. Tao. Aye. Tobert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The rules are suspended. This is the public hearing for Ordinance 21-11, granting the application of 1164 West 7th LLC to rezone property at 1164 7th Street West from RT2 Townhouse Residential to RM2 Multiple Family Residential and amending Chapter 60 of the Legislative Code pertaining to the zoning map. All right, and this item then we would keep, hold open the public hearing, but lay over till next week. And that way we yes. kind of cover the bases of uh, public hearing next week if there's something else that comes in and uh, getting through to the third and final reading. So um, thanks for fight, catching that before we adjourned here today. Um, Mr. Tolbert, I, it's Wes, Ms. Naker. <laughs> I, you know, I had a 50-50 there. Um, Ms. Naker moves to lay over the, uh, or hold open the public hearing and lay the matter over for one week. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tobert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is continued to April 21st. And now we have two more suspension items for legislative hearings. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, Ms. Jalali moves suspension of the rules. Roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yeah. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The rules are suspended. Um, the legislative hearing officer is asking that um, this item and the next be reconsidered so that the public hearing can be continued to May 19th. The first item is RLH AR 20-93 ratifying the assessments for securing and or emergency boarding services during February, 2020. 
And again, this item was adopted last week, but it should have been um, continued to May 19th. All right, so continue to May 19th. So moved by Ms. Jalali. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The resolution is reconsidered and the public hearing is continued to May 19th. And do we need to suspend again or? Do, Probably they... just to be safe. Okay, Ms. Naker, move suspension of the rules. Roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The rules are suspended. RLH AR 20-94, ratifying the assessments for towing of abandoned vehicle service during October 2019 at 814 Monoman Avenue. And the same thing for it to be reconsidered and public hearing continued to May 19th. So I'll move by Ms. Naker. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Baker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The resolution is reconsidered and the public hearing is continued to May 19th. The legislative hearing officer recommends uh, adoption of the following resolutions as no objections to these recommendations were received. Item 30, RLH TA 21-160, ratifying the appealed special tax assessment for property at 998 Armstrong Avenue. Item 31, RLH TA 21-31, um, I'm sorry, let me start over. My mind's <laughs> still on that ordinance, how it got missing. <laughs> Item 31, RLH FCO 21-31, 594 Brunson. Item 34, RLH TA 21-141, 1150 Central Avenue West. Item 33, RLH AR 21-29, 1052 Charles Avenue. Item 34, RLH TA 21-172, 731 Delaware Avenue. Item 37, RLH SAO 21-25, 741 Flandreau Street. Item 38, RLH SAO 21-23, 408 Grotto Street North. Item 39, RLH TA 21-148, 756 Jackson Street. Item 40, RLH TA 21-185, 410 Laurel Avenue. Item 41, RLH TA 21-140, 755 Minnehaha Avenue West. Item 42, RLH TA 21-145, 1033 Rainey Avenue. Item 43, RLH TA 21-164, 1746 Sims Avenue. Item 44, RLH TA 21-193, 1630 University Avenue West. Item 46, RLH BBR 21-16, 956 Western Avenue North. Item 47, RLH AR 21-24, collection of vacant building registration fees. Item 48, RLH AR 21-25, securing and or emergency boarding services. Item 49, RLH AR 21-26, demolition services. Item 50, RLH AR 21-27, collection of fire certificate of occupancy fees. And item 51, RLH AR 21-28, excessive use of inspection or abatement services. And again, the motion is to adopt these items. All right, so moved by Mr. Tao. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Bert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Baker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Bredmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearings are closed and the resolutions are adopted. 
For the following item, no objection to the legislative hearing officer's recommendation, amended recommendation was received and therefore she recommends amendment and adoption of item 35, RLH SAO 21-24, 616 Denoyer Avenue. And again, the motion would be to amend and adopt. I'm In my mind, I'm always playing the which council member game and I think this is Jalali. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, all through that whole list is what I, that's how I keep my mind engaged on these ones. So, um, so moved by Ms. Jalali. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tau? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Baker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolutions adopted as amended. Item, let's see, for the following item, the legislative hearing officer's recommendation is to continue the public hearing to May 12th. For item 36, RLH RR 21-32, 134 Elizabeth Street East. And again, the motion is to continue the public hearing to May 12th. All right, so moved by Ms. Naker. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Naker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is continued to May 12th. And for the final item, for the the legislative hearing officer's recommendation is to refer to legislative hearing on April 20th. Item 45, RLH TA 21-196, 1800 University Avenue West. And again, the motion is to refer to legislative hearing officer on April 20th. All right, so moved by Ms. Jalali. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Naker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The item is referred to the legislative hearing on April 20th. All right, before we adjourn, um, I would just ask if there's news from the wards. I, I'm going to do something a little different here. I'm going to try to share my screen. Ooh, fancy. Can you see it? <laughs> wow. Can you see it? No. <laughs> no, there yeah, no, those I I told you about the great horned owlets that are um nesting mm -hmm. here in Como Park. And oh. these are three um great horned owlets. Um they usually nest one to four and um they lay eggs kind of one at a time. So they they tend to be differing um, ages of um, maturity because like one will hatch and then three days later, one will hatch and another will hatch. But um, this is them it's still in their nest, but today they're out. Um, they've been starting to branch, but I just, I've been talking about it and I thought I would just share because um, it's just so darn magical. So that is, uh, that's my sharing for today. Um, I got to get out of I here. No, oh, they're great. I have baby chicken for them in my backyard. <laughs> um, all right, I have to figure out how to unshare. Um, share news repos when you return to the shared window. Ooh. Okay. Am I doing like the duplicate thing right now? No, no I'm good. Still shared. Okay. All if right. you click the button next to the leave, up, oh, I got it. I got it. Right? Good? Okay. So anyways, they're there. It's amazing. There's nature everywhere. They're coming through um, all over on our, our lakes and our parks. We're blessed to have such a wonderful green space. So I thought I would share the love a little bit. It's pretty magical. Ms. Naker. Well, my news from the ward isn't nearly that adorable, but it would be pretty <laughs> hard to match that. Um, <laughs> I'd like to announce that the West 7th Fort Road Federation's annual meeting um, is going to be this coming Tuesday, April 20th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. It's a chance to hear what's going on in the neighborhood and also elect new board members at the annual meeting. So anyone 16 years old or older who lives, owns a business or owns property in West 7th 
can vote and can run. Um, and they are featuring a very special guest, West 7th neighbor and our own public works director, Sean Kershaw. So an opportunity to tune in. That's very cool. And I know we've, um, I think I've heard Ms. Prince and others say this before, but the district councils are a great um, way to start getting involved in your neighborhood. And many um, people who go on to elected office started out on the district council. So it's a great way to start. And I love that we recently changed that lower age limit to 16. So um, opening up the door even wider. Uh, Mr. Tolbert. Yeah, I'll add on to that. Um, I think most district councils are having some sort of elections this time of year. So even if you're not in that specific one, look at your district council. They're either voting or taking applications for people who want to run for positions. Um, so I'll just toss that out there. Um, also, another committee that you could be on um, is Highland Bridge is seeking um, committee applications for um, the Artist Selection Committee and, and working with um, Public Arts St. Paul um, to decide what art is going to be at the Highland Bridge, and we're looking for artists to apply. So um, don't have to be a St. Paul resident. Obviously, we you know want as many St. Paul artists as we can um, include on that, so let people know um, more information on the city's Highland Bridge website, um, as well as um, our Facebook pages and everything like that. So if you know artists that would be interested in this, please send them, send them to apply. That's great. Ms. Prince. Thank you. Um, the, the reparations uh, resolution, the organizing around the uh, reparations initiative is moving forward. And I encourage anyone who is interested in serving on the council's mm -hmm. Legislative Advisory Committee on Reparations to go to our city website, stpaul.gov slash reparations. And you can find the application and information about what the work of the Legislative Advisory Committee will entail. Um, if you're interested in it, it is a, it, it's a commitment. It'll be a one-year committee that will probably meet about twice a month and be doing some really good, important, relevant work. And um, so if people have questions, do feel free to call any of us here on the council. And um, the, de the deadline for applying to the Legislative Advisory Committee is April 30th. So you have a couple more weeks, um, but do consider it. Thank you. Great, thanks Ms. Prince and any, uh... Uh, we'll, anyway, we can share that out on our networks. Um, we will do. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, other thoughts, news from the wards, or uh, things to share before we adjourn for the day? All right. It looks like we've come to the bottom of the list. And thank you, everybody. Like I said earlier this morning, we've covered a lot of ground today. And boy, we have again. So thank you very much for your work. Um, we are adjourned. Hello, I'm Minnesota Commissioner of Health, Jan Malcolm.